midway between the southeast coast of Australia and the island state of Tasmania, there lies a group of 42 islands. Admiralty charts call them the Thurno Group. They crowd together at the eastern end of Bass Strait, lost in the open immensity of the sea and the sky. Remote from the world, these islands first became the refuge of a small band of adventurers. Their life was hard and often dangerous, and always there was the sea to contend with. They fought the sea and its reefs and shoals that took ship after stricken ship and made the shores a graveyard of brigantines and barks. Close on the heels of the hard-living adventurers came sealers from England and America and early settlers who spread themselves amongst the outlying islands. In the course of time, their descendants moved into the big central island of Flinders and farmed the land at the foot of the mountains, as the people there do today. In the tradition of their ancestors, they still take their livelihood from the soil and from the sea around them. The waters no longer teem with seal, as they did a century and a half ago. Instead, they yield up rich hauls of crayfish. Loaded with cray pots, the boats go out regularly from the jetties and the lonely anchorages around the islands. Their goal, the rocky seabed where the crayfish swarm. Sometimes they travel in the company of a school of dolphins. The search for the undersea crevasse and the jagged rock bottom where the crayfish are most numerous takes the boats far and wide among the spread of the islands. Sometimes they move into the open sea, where no shore breaks the surge of the swell. Brought up to the sea, the island fishermen know well the dangers of storm and hidden reef in these rock-strewn waters. But they are risks accepted for the wealth which the sea returns. Across the sound from Flinders, the main island, is the settlement of Cape Barren Islanders. Here, the inhabitants attend to their sheep on the hills alongside the surf. For the Cape Barren Islanders, the arrival of the mail boat is a matter of great interest. It's their main contact with the rest of the island group and carries their mail and stores across from Flinders. The children of Cape Barren have their own school above the beach and in the glorious island climate can take their lessons in the open. Cape Barren Island with its sweep of open plain extending to the foothills is typical Furrow country. A feature of these open areas is the Manhai grass tree plant whose gum is used in the making of varnish and explosives, and its inner leaves, once used as a nourishing food. A bird seen in few other places in the world is the big Cape Barren Goose. It exists in large enough numbers to allow a brief open season. Island life is an outdoor one, whether it's on the farms or by the countless bays and beaches around the shores. It's not only the inhabitants who swim in these smooth blue waters, but tiger snakes of distant Chapel Island enjoy an occasional dip. Once, the people of the Furno were scattered throughout the many islands. Today, they occupy the two largest, Flinders and Cape Barren, 
and use many of the smaller ones for grazing their sheep and cattle. The stock are transported among the islands by trading vessels. Without fences and bounded only by the sea, they're left to graze unattended. When ready for market, they're taken off the islands and young ones are left to fatten in their place. One of the unique features of the Fano is its age-old mutton bird industry. Towards the end of summer, ordinary activities are suspended, as many of the island people prepare to leave for the outlying parts in pursuit of the sheer water or mutton bird. Every year, the Fano are visited by literally millions of the strange grey birds that fly in from the other side of the world. From the early 1800s, the Fano people have gone out in pursuit of them. Many of the birders sailed to the island rookeries year after year, taking with them supplies of firewood and food, enough to last the duration of the six-week season. On the way to the rookeries, they will pass some of the great variety of bird life for which the islands are famous. The wild black swan and the musk duck, the egret and ibis, and the tall grey heron. They all inhabit the quiet backwater of the inlets and lagoons. Then there's the world's finest high-diving seabird, the beautiful yellow-necked gannet. Nestling in its island fastness, undisturbed, except by the occasional visits of passing fishermen, the bird life has long been the interest of naturalists and scientists. The nomadic mutton bird, in particular, has been the subject of an intensive survey. By taking a selection of these birds with a numbered metal band, Scientists have been able to learn their habits and migratory movements and to discover that their numbers are slowly increasing despite the commercial harvesting. The taking of the mutton birds is strictly controlled and the season a brief one. The birds come to the islands to mate and to breed. They arrive over the Ferno at the same time every year to the very day after a flight that has covered a vast circuit of the Pacific Ocean. Before arriving at their island homes, they would have traveled past Japan to the Bering Sea and Alaska and across to Canada, an incredible flight of 20,000 miles. Gathered from the dense maze of burrows on the rookeries, the young mutton birds are taken to the processing sheds to be cleaned and then preserved in barrels of brine. Although large quantities of the birds are taken on the half dozen islands open for birding, they represent only a very small portion of the gigantic flock. During the season, trading vessels travel regularly among the islands, picking up the barrels of birds and taking them onto the Tasmanian coast and the Australian mainland. Altogether, this unique industry accounts for some quarter of a million birds by the end of the season. With the birding finished for another year, the island rookeries are left to the sea and the sky. The people go back to their farms and their sheep, and the quiet seclusion of their blue water islands.